That's the young version of me back in 1991. I was a dancer for the Victoria Filipino Canadian Association. Now, to be honest, I didn't even really choose to do this. It was my mom that got me started in Filipino dancing. And back then, if I had a choice, I probably wouldn't have joined up in the first place. There's me again visiting my family in the Philippines. See, there's no way I would be able to fully describe myself without describing my cultural background. It's who I am. It's how I came to be. I'm a Filipino-Canadian, a second-generation immigrant. I was born and raised in Canada while my parents are from the Philippines. I've heard that second-generation immigrants often see themselves as a bridge between two worlds that move at different speeds. I don't remember ever having a huge struggle with my identity, but it wasn't until I was asked whether I considered myself a Canadian first or a Filipino first that I really didn't know who I was. It made me wonder about the experiences of other second-generation immigrants like myself, so I thought it would be good to gain some insight into my own life by looking into the lives of others like me. This isn't a generalized account of the second-generation immigrant experience. This is our experience, the world as we see it, through our eyes. <laughs> yeah, Kobe, there you yeah. go. Um, you know all about the, the karaoke machines and the oh, rice cooker and the minivan oh, yeah. and Tito Rey. And... <laughs> Russell Peters has been a comedian for over 17 years. He's made a career out of poking fun of racial stereotypes from his own cultural background and of others. I've often wondered how comedians like Russell Peters have found such success in incorporating the sometimes embarrassing aspects of our culturally diverse backgrounds. Because I think I do it true and honest. I mean, so that the people you're talking about go, oh my God, how did he know that about us? Like, you guys think you have these little secrets, and I just kind of uncover them to you, and you go, oh my God, they know what we're doing. I mean, I, I don't do it for any kind of message or anything. I just do it because it's, you know, it's, it's what I know how to do. I just, I just talk, and I hope people find it funny. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it out there for people to walk out going, man, he's a really deep guy. Because I'm really not that deep, I just, uh, I don't think I'm deep, at least some people do, I mean, whatever. Um, but I just do it because I want people to laugh, I want people to feel good. Mm -hmm. I want people to feel comfortable in a room full of all kinds of different people. Mm -hmm. Just walk out and enjoy the exact same thing as everybody else. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, that's what I want, really. I, a lot of segregation in the world nowadays. People who say, you know, it was segregated back in the day, it was forcibly segregated back in the day. Now people are doing it on their own and it's not good. Like of the future, because there's no people aren't intermixing as much as they do. The first person I decided to talk to sees himself as a Canadian first. Aaron Lopez is a mixed race Filipino Canadian. His father is originally from the Philippines and his mother from Canada. Aaron showed me that not all second generation immigrants grow up with two cultural backgrounds. I don't really feel Filipino at all, really. I, I know that my background is Filipino my, on my father's side, but I don't really feel. Filipino in that national kind of sense at all. I think I remember asking my dad when I was little, like, why don't I speak, you know, Tagalog? And he, he said, because, like, he'd rather have me speaking fluent English, um, you know, and, like, not really, like, don't even worry about Tagalog, right? Just, you know, work on English and do well in school because he saw the opportunity Canada has. In a way, I was, you know, it's kind of not upsetting, but it's like, it'd be nice to be bilingual, right? I'm not really too upset. Like, it, it'd be nice to have, but I'm not really affected by it. Like, I don't really plan on living in the Philippines or anything like that. I saw a lot of myself in Aaron, which made me wonder if I had let my Canadian side remain dominant over my Filipino side. I saw no differences between the ways we lived our lives until I started asking him questions about the lines of communication between himself and his parents. I asked Aaron how open he is to talk to his parents. Not really at all. And I think that really does stem from, you know, my Canadian independence, sort of, because I notice in the Philippines, it's everything's on the table, sort of. But uh, you know, when I was like here, I don't really bother other people with my my things because I notice like a big thing is that you know um, Canada is sort of everyone's doing their own thing. You know what I mean? And so I did, yeah. I, I sort of know that, like, I kind of. I don't want to bother other people with my, you know, problems or whatever, so I figure out my own, but in the Philippines, it'd be totally different. From personal, you know, preference, I actually like to do things on my own. But again, that's sort of like Canadian conditioning, I think. This is Anson Tran. He's been one of my closest friends since high school. Having parents from different cultural backgrounds has been a topic of our conversations a lot. Because I've known Anson for as long as I have, 
hearing about his experience has genuinely affected me and has made me reflect the most into my own life. His experience growing up goes deeper than any other person I talk to, and much of that experience began at a young age in a social environment. Growing up socially, like uh, just at school, I tried to just fit in as much as possible. So um, basically, the way I saw myself was just as just another kid, like devoid of my ethnicity, just just there, just just a kid growing up, going to school, hanging with friends. I had a core group of friends. Um, maybe just one or two like really really good friends and when I thought about them like coming over and like seeing how we interacted like I wanted my parents to speak English that was pretty that was pretty big for me well to be honest I wanted my mom to speak English because my dad's English just butchered horrible I have like a friend for everything it's kind of weird and so I've got my longboarding friend and I've got my you know computer friend and my tennis friend and so I've got it's, I've got kind of a set of friends, and you know, most of them are white. I think one of them is uh, is second generation Chinese, and so you know, we play tennis all the time, but doesn't really, we never notice. Like, oh wait, I'm second generation immigrant. So my friends were all different characters. They were all we sort of described ourselves, especially in elementary school, as like the different characters on Saved by the Bell. And so we had like, we had the geek, and the pretty girl, and the super smart brainiac. Um, and we just, we all got along really well together, we just had a good vibe. In my elementary school we had about 30 to 35 kids in our class, and we sort of stuck together from kindergarten to grade 7. And I would say there was, I remember there being one boy who was East Indian, half East Indian, half Dutch. and one girl who was First Nations and I think the three of us were maybe the only people who were different ethnically than everybody else who was Canadian. I feel that my friends have always been really open to cultural diversity so that has just instilled in me um, a desire to learn about different cultures just because they were all, it seemed like they were always learning about my culture so I always wanted to learn about different cultures. It's probably the, the best learning tool that we had because I mean so we're able to interact with like friends of like different ethnic backgrounds. I had friends that are Chinese and like Caucasian and obviously some Indian friends as well too. And you kind of see like the differences in the households and kind of it's kind of like the best way to learn about different different cultural backgrounds pretty, pretty quickly. For me, like I didn't really see diversity. What I what I thought was different was bad. Like I just wanted to be part of the group. I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be outcasted. Like it was really important for me to have friends or not be made fun of or teased. When I was in elementary school, I was the only Asian kid in the class. The rest of the class was white, except for eventually later on there was like another Filipino girl. But um, because of that, like I really tried to fit in. But when I went to high school, there were a lot more um, kids from different cultural backgrounds, like Asian kids and whatnot. And so when I began to see that, I began to be uh, proud in being different, proud in being Asian and I saw diversity as a good thing, as something that differentiates you, but in a unique way. I began to appreciate that more and I began to see it more rather than just see everyone as um, just trying to fit in as just one cohesive group. In elementary school, the majority of my friends were Caucasian. I didn't ever really have any problems fitting in with them. As far as I can remember, race wasn't ever an issue with us, and there really wasn't ever that much of a difference between my friends and I. But the one difference I did notice was the way we interacted with our parents. The first time I ever went to visit a friend at his house was the first time I noticed a huge separation between my home life and my social life. When I think about it, my home life and my social life are almost completely different. But I can feel the two of them coming to a crossroads and meeting and like my home life and my social life began to began to meld, they began to gel better. Like. My parents would be able to relate to what was happening whenever I went out with my friends and or when I brought my friends back, I could joke around with them. Like whereas before, like it would be unheard of. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do any of this or they would think I'm getting too uh white. So I don't know, the lines have been blurred. It's not so much when I'm at home I'm hard working Vietnamese boy, like uh, huge into his family very strict, uh, 
no frills type of no no frills type of guy. Whereas when I'm outside with my friends, I'm joking around, I'm laughing, I'm loud, I'm outgoing, and just I can just be crazy and like you know it's accepted. But then now I'm, I do a little bit of both. Like sometimes like uh, when I'm at home with my family, I'll joke and I'll laugh and I'll tell them outrageous stories like I would tell my friends. Or when I'm out with my friends and now there's like. Uh, there's a side of me where I don't have to be all rambunctious or all crazy to have fun, you know? We can just sit and we can talk. I've taken a bit from both worlds and they've just kind of come closer together. I guess with like, with, I find with East Indian parents in general, they're quite, they're quite strict. But I mean, mine, as far as Indian parents go, are, they're quite lenient as far as Indian parents go. But at the same time, they're, uh, they have their rules and they're quite strict with them. But we got along quite well. Like, we're quite, uh, our, as kids, like me and my brother and sister were all quite controlled. So. I mean, we got along well, but like we were kind of scared of our parents at the same time too. Just because like you don't want to, you don't want to get like that evil look from your mom or your dad because you know you're gonna go home, you've done something wrong, and you're gonna get smacked in the face or not really like abused, but uh, you know, you're kind of afraid that your parents are gonna get mad at you about something. We would have to report home first after school, and then you know ask parents for permission to go out and hang out with their friends after class. Whereas they would just go straight to their friend's house right after class, and then from their friend's house call home and say, "Well, I'm at, I'm at so and so's house, and that should be fine." But we we had a bit more control that way from our parents. The atmosphere in my household as I was growing up was one full of um, love and happiness. I have a very close relationship with both of my parents and my brother, and as a child I remember just being happy all the time and getting excited about the most silly things. Really, I got raised by my, my brothers and sisters, sort of, in a way, in that sort of sense. Like, I think, you know, naturally, uh, most kids who have, like, brothers and sisters spend more time with their siblings than they do their parents, I think, like, especially in my family. And so, um, again, that's sort of like how, how strangely, I don't know how it happened, but um, we were very tight knit within my, you know, my siblings and whatnot. So we sort of raised each other in that kind of way, like especially my oldest brother. I started realizing that my parents and I had different values and opinions about things, mainly at, in junior high, I would say. And I think it was mainly because of like relationships, a lot of my friends in grade seven had boyfriends and my parents or my dad especially was like, you don't have a boyfriend, do you? Or you shouldn't have a boyfriend, you're too young for that. My parents are still very, uh, very traditional in a lot of ways coming from India. Um, and I actually was just back in India a few months ago. So I mean, I got a bit more perspective on why they act the way they do now. But like, I mean, culture here is entirely different from India um, in so many ways. I mean, kids there, they won't stay out past seven or eight o'clock at night. They'll come home and then it's all just totally family oriented, which I'm I understand because I'm a big family person myself, but at the same time, like, they don't understand the way culture works here because, I mean, kids have school and work during the days, and the only time they can really hang out with their friends is in the evenings till, like, you know, 10, 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night, and then the whole, like, the nightlife scene with bars and whatnot doesn't really happen in India at all as well. So, I think there's a lot of differences that parents and I have along lines of, like, the whole social aspect of hanging out with friends and whatnot because it's not the same as is in India at all here. Well, in both my parents' cultures, it's not really acceptable for a girl to have a boyfriend or people to be going out, it's sort of just like, I don't know, it seems as though they have this idea where you are supposed to just meet and then get married, and there's sort of no in-between. So I'm a lot more open to people being boyfriend-girlfriend or living together or even like same-sex relationships. In high school, it wasn't really a big problem, and then in university, I started going out with somebody, and um, I didn't tell them at first, and eventually they did end up finding out, and they were okay with it. They were. I think it was my own paranoia about the whole situation that made me not tell them. And as soon as they found out about it, they were a lot more cool about it than I thought they were going to be. I think that's big with Indian people as well as the way you're, the way you kind of look in in society. So like if you do something wrong, um, the community likes to talk, and they'll like to uh, just kind of kind of bring you down in a way where they want to kind of make themselves look better in comparison to you, just because that they see you do something wrong. Um, me personally, now I I differ greatly because I don't really care what people think about me at all. And I guess it's kind of like, it might be a bit of a Western attitude to have, but I mean, it just it doesn't bother me if people are going to talk about me at all. It's just their own choice, because I am who I am. I thought that they would freak out about me having a boyfriend, but um, I don't know why I thought that they would freak out. I guess we sometimes fail to realize that we aren't the only ones trying to adapt to the culture we live in. We sometimes seem to be so guarded against the customs of our cultural backgrounds that in our eyes, our parents can never change. I remember learning that a large part of our personal growth and development comes from our ability to acquire our own values and opinions. Some of these values differ greatly from our parents. Some of them will never change and are passed down through generations. 
life for Anson. Coming to terms with his own views and opinions that differ from his parents was a huge turning point in his life. We see eye to eye on some things, but on other things it's just like, it's like you know when you have two magnets, but you turn them around and you push them apart, it's just complete polar opposites. As a little kid, my values deferred every time they said no to something. So that's, that was pretty obvious. But on a more specific point, I think it was when I graduated from high school and I wanted to take a year off and they wanted me to go to school. And I went to school to please them, but then uh, I always felt that that one year that I could have taken off would have given me some direction in what I wanted in life. When I had that, when I was in that sort of depressive rut, it got me thinking. And that's when I noticed that our value systems differed on certain levels by so much they weren't even in the same playing field. That's when I noticed like, just what my parents wanted was completely different from what I wanted despite the fact that I've grown up believing I've wanted all the things that they've ever wanted for me. Up to then, uh, going up against my parents, changing um, or having anything that deferred from what they believed in was just like, it wasn't, I couldn't register it. Like, it just didn't exist in my reality. I've heard all kinds of stories I can relate to from people who are living similar lives to my own. There is no way a story could ever be complete without looking at every side. I turned to Anton's parents to find out the differences between life in Canada and life in Vietnam. I wanted to know if they see the Vietnamese culture fading in their son. In, in my country, I find out that, um, you know, like we have a culture that we don't show, we don't express our um, feelings a lot. I hardly talk to my mom or my dad and express how, how I feel about myself. Or, uh, showing how I love them, uh, how I care for them, because you you just have like between mom and dad, you just look at them like they so big and they so you know uh, strict a person. You can even uh, give them a hug and tell them that you know I love you or something like that. But in here, I find out that this have a lot of you know chances that they can. If Anson didn't like something, he can just come up and tell me and. You know, like, uh, he showed me how he happy and you know, how he upset about it. It's a, a good thing that, you know, like he adapted the way in Western way that, you know, like you, you, you can tell your parents, you can, you know, like show them how you feel. I hope that Anson will keep it, you know, like not 100% faded because whatever uh, he tried to adapt it to the Western way, he has to remember that he can, he can change quite a lot, but he cannot change the color of his hair and his color of his skin. He's still a Vietnamese. And, you know, in his heart, he's still a Vietnamese boy. But I, I think it cannot change, you know. It's uh, transformed to adapt to the environment, but the root is, is there, so never change it. But the appearance, the life, you know, you have to change your adapt. Like if you come to my country, Vietnam, you cannot wear a jacket too hot. So you have to take your jacket off to adapt with that environment, you know, to be there. And then when you come to Canada, and you have to wear a jacket on, you just uh, transform to adapt with that environment to live with. But the rules are always there. You cannot change the rules. Talking to Anton's parents made me want to seek out more information. I wanted to learn more by looking into my own life. I wanted to know if my parents went through the same thing Anson's parents did. I finally worked up the courage to take home a camera and interview my own parents. I learned a lot through the stories they told me about their adolescence, and I saw a lot of myself in those stories. Listening to the stories of my parents has helped me to see why we interact the way we do now, and why they were so protective of my sister and I when we were younger. You and Miley, we we were protective of you. We, we also wanted you to be able to communicate to us, to be open with us. Um, and we've encouraged that. We've, encu we've encouraged, um, we've always encouraged a dialogue between us. So the, the only thing I can add to that is like you and Miley, we've ever, always encouraged you, we've always been supported you. And, you know, knowing that you were in the right age, like even when you were growing up as teenagers, we have to guide you, right? There's always the guidance there. But like, we can only do so much. We get, like, we, we're not going to be around you 24-7, right? So the trust is there. 
and uh, I know that you know what what's wrong or you know what's right or what's wrong, and it's up to you. You know, you make the you, you make the call. I mean, like as I've said, we're not always around you, but we had always encourage you to to come to us for if there's anything. We are both adults now, and I couldn't ask for a better situation. I'd say you and Miley and your dad are the best things that ever happened to, to me. I've heard that second generation immigrants often see themselves as a bridge between two worlds that move at different speeds. I still see it that way, but I don't see it in a negative light. I learned about the experiences of other second generation immigrants, and in comparing their stories to my own, I've learned a lot about myself. I still don't know whether I consider myself a Canadian first or a Filipino first, but what I do know is that I'm proud of who I am. This isn't a generalized account of the second generation immigrant experience. This is our experience. The world as we see it. Life through our eyes. I really appreciate the sort of Canadian attitude towards cultural diversity. Um, I have never felt ever in 23 years or 21 years that I've been here discriminated against um, and I have never seen it happen in front of my face so I'm grateful for that and I really appreciate that and that's I think that's a Canadian a very Canadian attitude that we have. I think the fact that like I can call myself an Indo-Canadian the fact that I see the best of both worlds I mean I have, I have all my parents their, their whole cultural ideals as well as my own that I picked up from Canada here as well too so I'm I'm able to kind of take a step back and look at both cultures and kind of pick and choose what I think are the best qualities to have, which is a huge thing. There are certain values that my parents passed on to me that I treasure and I, I absolutely cherish. And I take those values that make me feel that way and I will pass them on to my children and I hope my children pass them on to their grandchildren. There are also some values that I never saw eye to eye with my parents. And maybe, you know, along my road of life as I get older, I might come to see the wisdom in those values and then I'll, of course, pass them on to my children. But if how I feel about those values is okay, then I'll pass on my version of those values because I feel that I've adapted them to the culture that I'm in. Because, I mean, no one's perfect, right? Nothing's definite.